Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Our window to act is narrowing. That's the message from Canadian health officials. This is a societal response, and everybody must take that responsibility. Canadians trying to get home, but they're getting conflicting messages about what to do when they get here. The COVID-19 situation is evolving by the minute. Our medical experts answer key questions on protecting your health. The Vancouver lab hunting for treatment. For two years, we've had funding to prepare a technology for exactly this type of situation. And because of that, we're now ideally suited to respond quickly to this outbreak. And how communities are coming together to help the most vulnerable stay apart. Instead of buying into the panic, we should really help each other out. This is The National. With another increase in the number of Canadian cases of COVID-19, tonight new measures and new pressure from governments and health officials aimed at getting you to practice one crucial thing, social distancing, to try to minimize the spread of this virus. My message today is we have a chance right here, right now. We all do our part, act together in solidarity. More than 80 new cases were announced in Canada today, pushing the total to more than 340. The biggest jumps were in Ontario, Alberta and Quebec. And in Quebec today, a new order from the Premier for many public spaces to close, like bars, gyms and movie theatres. Nova Scotia announcing its first cases today. It will close all public schools for three weeks. PEI making the same move. Alberta has also now cancelled classes. Health officials there and in the city of Ottawa warning of the same thing. We do assume that the coronavirus COVID-19 is circulating in Ottawa, that there is local community transmission of the virus. So climbing numbers, community transmission, it can sound very alarming, but what does that actually mean for you and your risk and how you can try to reduce it? Well, in a few minutes, we'll hear from a doctor on that. But first, let's take a look at what's happening at airports. Canadians scrambling to get home tonight as their flight options diminish. Here's David Common. Chicago's O'Hare Airport, one of the world's busiest, looked like a potential Petri dish, with swarms of travelers lined up for hours, facing added questions at customs. Glad to be home. Meanwhile, at Toronto's Pearson, plenty of face masks among weary travelers, some who'd cut short plans and raced home. You came back early. Yeah. Why'd you come back early? Um, I'm working there and there's no school for the foreseeable future, so come home. But just getting a flight is a challenge. The wait time to WestJet's call center, up to 42 hours today. I just didn't want to get stuck over here. Um, yeah, for days on end. Hyla Zeifman managed to grab a flight out of India to Toronto, but via a U.S. airport where strict entry requirements are now in place. What's it like at the airport there right now? Um, you know, everyone's wearing masks. People are, you know, you can feel the tension. Stephanie Tuck may be stuck in the Philippines after many flights were grounded. We spent all day at the airport, but it was absolute mayhem. Every traveler was there trying to get a flight home. It was advice from the federal government that triggered a lot of this panic to get back. The advice being, come home while there are commercial options to do so. And it is expected it will get more difficult in the coming days. Land border crossings could also become busier as tens of thousands of Canadian snowbirds pack up and head home. It's probably a lot of panic, but we're worried about borders closing, rightfully so. Deb Corbeil flew to Florida to help drive her parents home. They were going to go to a shuffleboard tournament, and I said, you can't do that. Her mom, Marlene, in the next car has a pre-existing lung condition. Oh, I just can't wait to get back into Canada. <laughs> just want to touch that soil. <laughs> and that is the sentiment for many, as getting home gets harder. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. For people inside this country, the message today from health officials, you can help slow down the spread of the virus. But as Ashley Burke shows us, there's serious questions being raised about how well Canada's message to travelers is getting through. This is our chance right here, right now. An urgent call for action from public health officials for every single Canadian. Our window to flatten the curve of the epidemic is narrow. We all need to act now. The curve refers to the rate the virus is spreading. Flattening it means stopping a spike that will overwhelm the health system. By these social distancing measures 
and, and avoiding non-essential uh, gatherings or travel, we can dampen any sort of uh, transmission within our society. While Canada's top doctor wants everyone to stay home, Canada's foreign affairs minister wants Canadians to come home. There's more flight restrictions. There are airports which are being closed down. Uh, the number of flights around the world is decreasing by the hours. His advice, don't panic, plan, and don't count on Canada to get you home later. But there's no doubt that there would be no way for the Canadian government to repatriate um, everyone around the world. The situation is changing so quickly, some airports haven't caught up with the new messaging for all international travelers to self-isolate for two weeks. Some arriving from the U.S. today said they weren't screened at all. On the kiosk, we had to identify whether we were uh, coming from Italy, Iran, one of the troubled spots. Have you been told to self-isolate now? No. We haven't. They didn't even tell us here. The government held an emergency cabinet meeting today, emerging to say answers to questions about further border and flight measures will come tomorrow. What's your advice to Canadians who are outside the country right now who have a lot of anxiety? So, we understand that people are facing anxiety. These are uh, exceptional times and of course they call for exceptional measures. What those exceptional measures are and how long it could take to implement them is still a big question. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, we're joined now by Dr. Tasleem Nimji, an emergency room doctor in Toronto. And, and Dr. Nimji, Public Health Canada's website is describing the, the risk of transmission in Canada as low. That might surprise some people. It does point out that it could change at any time. But I'm curious about, from your perspective, practically speaking, how should we uh, respond to that assessment? Yeah, so I think when we're talking about that that assessment as low, that's again because uh, almost all of the cases in Canada are cases that we can track the, the um, there's defined uh, tra a chain of transmission for those cases. So we can track the contacts, we can isolate them, we can test them so that we can try to still contain the outbreak. That said, we've heard a lot about the risk of community transmission and us moving into that reality. And that's why you've seen some of these really aggressive uh, measures around social distancing in the last couple of days, really less than a week. And also measures like, you know, decreasing visitation at seniors' homes, at long-term care facilities, at hospitals, uh, limiting travel, all things that we can do to try to keep us in that low risk zone as opposed to moving out of that. Again, while we are in a low risk time, certainly doesn't mean that we can be cavalier because it are these, it's these measures really, these social distancing measures that are going to help us to flatten that curve as we keep saying to try to keep us at lower risk as possible given what we're facing. All right. Well, we're going to chat a little bit later on uh, in the hour as well as uh, bring in uh, a doctor from Vancouver. Dr. Nimji, thank you. My pleasure. Canada's first fatality from the coronavirus happened one week ago tonight at an elder care facility in North Vancouver. Older Canadians remain most at risk from the virus, but measures to limit contact could have a dangerous side effect. Tina Lovegreen shows us why. I'm debating going in. Because Carol Ann Oswald hasn't visited her father for two weeks. Because I teach students with special needs and would put them at risk if I caught anything. Instead, she calls her 88-year-old father, who lives at the Lynn Valley Care Centre, where a man died after getting the virus last week and where four more residents have tested positive, along with 12 health care workers. So far, her father, who has dementia, is fine, kept isolated in his room. He might think we're just not visiting. And that is, that's what really gets to me, is that he might not know that we really want to see him. Her decision to stay away is voluntary. In B.C., people are urged not to go into care homes. But there is no outright ban like in Quebec or in Ontario, where only essential visitors are allowed, meaning the family of those dying or very ill. B.C. care homes have enhanced the screening of visitors. Sick people and recent international travellers aren't allowed in. But some places have added their own measures. And we're seeing practices now around restricting visiting hours at care homes. Experts say it's a difficult balance, keeping seniors safe from the virus and also from loneliness. There are a lot of people, as I mentioned before, with dementia who need those visits. And without those, they can really become disoriented. They can develop something called delirium, which is a confusion that happens on top of dementia. Uh, it makes it very difficult to offer them care. That's exactly why Oswald worries about missing visits. He's going to be 
very, very, very lonely and isolated. But hopes the phone calls are enough to keep him well for as long as the danger remains. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Today, Quebec went further than any other province to keep people from gathering in public. Ainsley McClellan shows us why some workers are worrying that they won't be able to pay their bills. In downtown Montreal, many restaurants are already less bustling than usual. And now they'll be even quieter, ordered by the government to run at half capacity. That means keeping customers apart. We're going to mark off half our tables uh, as non-usable. Uh, we're going to measure that uh, each table is about three meters apart. While restaurants here can stay open for now, other businesses such as movie theaters, gyms, spas and bars must close. That caught some patrons off guard. I'm shocked because they don't even close the airport before. It should have closed the airport before closing the bars. The measures are needed to limit spaces where people are in close contact, says Premier Francois Legault, and they're not optional. It's an order, but we have to count on the good faith of Quebecers. Uh, I cannot send police in each exactly. restaurant making sure that they use only 50% of the capacities. Other provinces are taking similar measures. As in Quebec, Ontario and Nova Scotia are closing all casinos. And some businesses are choosing to shut down. Ski hills like Mont Tremblant in Quebec and Whistler Blackcomb in BC. And brands like Nike and Apple have announced store closures. Many worry that closing stores, shuttering bars and thinning out restaurants will lead to economic hardship. I'm questioning a lot of things now. I mean, it might not last long. It could last two weeks, but who knows? The federal government and some provinces have said there will be financial help for businesses and workers hurt by the outbreak. Many say that support can't come soon enough. Ainsley McClellan, CBC News, Montreal. And there are more closures in the United States in a bid to clamp down on the spread of the virus there. Almost every state has reported cases, with New York, Washington, and California the worst hit. Tonight, there are at least 3,300 cases, at least 65 deaths. At the White House, a move to control another contagion. Financial fear got some presidential praise. More now from Paul Hunter. Beautiful day outside. Said Donald Trump today in a bid to help the U.S. economy caught in the fast-growing coronavirus fallout the U.S. Federal Reserve is dropping federal interest rates to near zero and is pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into the economy. As Trump put it... We're very happy. I have to say this. I'm very happy. From the airline industry, and today American Airlines, for example, announced further cuts to its international flights, to the cruise ship industry, to small businesses, to basically anything that relies on people spending money, coronavirus threatens the U.S. economy. Then there are the other challenges. Last night, police tried to send revelers crowding the streets of New Orleans home for their own safety. Few seemed willing. Today, more cities and states are shutting restaurants and bars altogether, or at least limiting the size of those allowed to sit together. Meanwhile, those lineups at drive through virus testing centers seemed only to grow, not to mention those at grocery stores. On that, today, said Trump multiple times, no need to hoard. You don't have to buy so much. Take it easy. Just relax. People are going in and they're buying more. They, I remember, uh, I guess, during the conversation, Doug of Walmart said that they're buying more than they buy at Christmas. Relax. We're doing great. It all will pass. The U.S. also said today more testing capability will soon kick in, but key to a safer country underlined Trump's top scientist on this again today, social distancing. The worst is yes ahead for us. It is how we respond to that challenge that's going to determine what the ultimate endpoint is going to be. In other words, if you can, just stay home. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Our senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong, joins us. And, and Peter, what's the Fed telling us with these moves? Essentially in that it's just as scared of what's going on as, as you and I are, that the biggest and most powerful central bank in the world is as nervous as markets are. And what's interesting here is that by taking the Fed rate as low as it has, effectively to zero, many say the Fed has really run out of policy options here, that it doesn't have a whole lot else it can do after this. So with as big and as bold a move as it made today, it's telling the banks and the big financial institutions that we'll do what we can to keep you operating and make sure that they have 
access to credit. Because as somebody wrote on Twitter today, having functioning money markets, that's not going to solve the problem. But any potential solution down the road isn't going to work unless there's functioning money markets when that happens. So the Fed's saying it will do what it can for now to keep those credit markets open and working. So a lot of people holding their breath. Will the markets actually buy in? Well, they're not so far. The overnight futures markets have been another ugly day. The S&B futures sold off so much, in fact, that it, it hit a preset triggered limit. Uh, so now we're going to have to wait and watch what Asian markets do, what European markets do overnight, and then what happens on Bay Street and on Wall Street tomorrow morning. Okay. Thanks, Peter. You bet. Right now, the front line of the fight against the virus is Europe. More cases are emerging there each day than in the rest of the world combined. A world that is watching Italy with alarm. Despite weeks of quarantines, total cases there continue to jump 15 to 20 percent a day and now stand at more than 24,000. Another example, Germany has seen its caseload more than double since midweek to at least 4,800. In Spain, the second worst outbreak in Europe has also accelerated with more than 7,700 cases. Briar Stewart shows us a country and a continent that is being shocked into action. The message rang loud and clear above bridges and throughout the nearly empty squares in Spain after the number of deaths from coronavirus doubled in 24 hours to more than 285. Despite being ordered to stay inside, some were confidently defiant. We are completely in a good athletic form and I think we think that uh, is not uh, a problem for us. Across Europe, resorts, schools and even borders are being closed, but some aren't heeding the warnings. Video of this crowd at a bar in Dublin infuriated Ireland's health minister, who said it was an insult to health care workers. Today in France, President Emmanuel Macron urged citizens to get out and vote in local elections, while at the same time, the government shut down restaurants and cafes. For the voters who did show up, some were in masks, Others were unimpressed. The elections were going ahead. They could have postponed the elections, this man says. It wouldn't have changed anything. In Italy, where more than 1,800 people have now died, hospitals remain overwhelmed, and medical teams have turned empty warehouses into treatment centers. The UK has experienced a surge in cases this weekend, but the government has not enacted restrictive measures yet but says in the coming weeks it will ask anyone over 70 to self-isolate for perhaps as long as four months. I'm right into that category and I don't fancy it. I do think they do have to take it very serious and people to protect themselves. Because they are part of the group that is the most at risk as the virus continues to spread. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. The WHO has warned about misinformation spreading faster than the virus itself. What about eating garlic, that that's going to help you? That makes no sense. Up next, we separate fact from fiction, and our panel of doctors explains what social distancing means for your life. Plus, searching for a treatment for COVID-19. You can't kill a virus, but you can suppress it. The progress happening behind the scenes. And later, how Canadians are pulling together. Instead of buying into the panic, we should really help each other out at this point. From errands to checking in on seniors. All that ahead. Fear can spread faster than any disease, and with it, a lot of misleading or just plain bogus information. Lorenda Redekop helps debunk some of the claims that are coursing through social networks. The advice about COVID-19 is popping up all over online. If you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, you're safe and don't have the virus. There's already an all-natural coronavirus vaccine, and it works. We took some claims to an expert. Colin Furness is an epidemiologist with the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information. If you drink water every 15 minutes, you're going to wash it away. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, if you thought there was COVID-19 in your throat, drinking water would push it into your body, into your intestines, where it actually might get a foothold. What about eating garlic, that that's going to help you? That makes no sense. Um, garlic has antibacterial properties. This would have no impact on a virus. What about that you really need a lot of bottled water for this? 
yeah, this is not a waterborne uh, virus at all. We are seeing too that maybe this virus doesn't survive in hot countries. Viruses don't like heat and we don't know exactly what kind of threshold. If I cough on you inside, it doesn't matter what the weather is. Social media and technology companies are trying to fight this. Google searches about the virus now trigger an SOS alert and bring up information from mainstream trusted sources first. You might see this on a Facebook post. The social media platform is attempting to limit misinformation and harmful content. It's also prohibiting some ads while offering ads to the WHO for free. For Ness says it's important for officials who inform the public to keep it simple. Piling on more information, even if it's great information, is actually not going to help people right now who really need it the most. People are panicking who cannot process that. For everybody else, he says pay attention to the source of the information. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. So there's lots of reputable advice out there too and the assessments from public health officials are both very clear but they also change sometimes every day based on circumstances and, and to an extent perhaps based on where those officials are based. So let's bring in two emergency room doctors to see how they're interpreting the, the recommendations. Dr. Michael Curry based in Vancouver works at an emergency room just outside the city and once again uh, Dr. Tasleem Nimji is in Toronto and Dr. Curry let, let me start with you. Let's talk about restaurants. Is your perspective that it's safe still to dine out? I, I think it's a matter of what your risk tolerance is. Everything in life entails some degree of risk. And when you do go to a restaurant, you know, there is a risk of transmission despite best practices. But I think we have to balance out convenience, the need for people to to go out and entertain themselves, and also the need to support our local businesses with the public health costs. It's not a risk-free decision, but by minimizing space, practicing good hygiene, you can make it a low-risk activity. Yeah, and as recently as Friday, Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Chief Medical Health Officer out here, did mention restaurants as a potential thing that people can do. Dr. Nimji, from Toronto, does, that, uh, does the advice, uh, is it different? Yeah, I mean, I have to say there's a bit of a, I would say there's almost a palpable difference over the last uh, three, four days here in terms of people hunkering down a little bit more, um, being a little less social, going out a little bit less. Uh, and we're certainly, I think, seeing that also from the aging population and those that might see themselves at increased risk really sort of staying back from those social engagements. Well, let's follow up, Dr. Nimji, on that. In terms of uh, older people, there's a lot of concern among them or people who have, uh, you know, are compromised in terms of their immune systems and having interaction with maybe grandchildren or, you know, other people in their family. How should they balance that? Yeah, so you're right. Certainly there's always a risk of social isolation and certainly there's some seniors that are living on their own. And it's really important that we sort of pull together as a community at this time and support those people. So we are seeing, for example, out of Quebec where uh, the recommendation is really for people over 70 to not be going out um, and people with any comorbidities or immune compromised states, as you mentioned. And so as much as that can be limited, it should be. And I think if we can support dropping off groceries, checking in, picking up medications, things like that, we should be doing to try try to keep our frail and elderly um, out of harm's way as much as possible. Uh, Dr. Curry, and I'll, I'll ask each of you this question because it also may be different from city to city. What about, you know, restaurants might be a, a kind of an optional thing for people, grocery stores, uh, more basic. Uh, what should people keep in mind, Dr. Curry, as they go to the grocery? I think just basic good hygiene. So perhaps taking advantage of the wipes to wipe down the cart washing your hands before and after your shopping, and of course maintaining your social distance, trying to stay approximately a meter away from people that you're encountering. Grocery shopping is not going to stop anytime soon, but let's try and make it as safe as possible for everyone. Dr. Nimji? Yeah, I just, I mean, that's excellent. And we keep saying washing your hands and we're not going to stop saying that, but certainly to add to that as well is trying to do it off peak hours uh, and just pack your patients. Everyone's sort of anxiety levels are high mm -hmm. and the more we can sort of act like in a brotherly way, the better this will go for all of us, right? So let me pick up on that, Dr. Nimji. You know, anxiety, I, I keep seeing that word, you know, reference to, to how anxious people are feeling. You know, some people tweeting about how they're, you know, freaking out. They describe that uh, about themselves. How, how do you, you know, the medical part aside, how do you deal with, with, with the mental health uh, issues that people are going through? 
You know, it's, I'm so glad you brought that up because it is it is a big issue, right? And certainly some people have a different capacity to um, to tolerate isolation than others. Um, and everybody has a different social circumstance or situation. And I think anxiety levels are high because this is new territory for many people, especially for the younger people who didn't experience SARS in Toronto, for those coming from an Ontario perspective, this is very new. And so anxiety levels are just high from the uncertainty that this comes with. But again, we're, we're very fortunate. We have previous experience in this country. We have really great officials in terms of public health officials that are leading the way for us. And we need to really sort of depend on their guidance and follow their guidance. Dr. Curry, let me pick up on a point that Dr. Nimji made there. Where are you guys getting information from? Where should we be relying for, to, on whom should we be relying for the best information? Well, I think our first our first step is to turn to our public health authorities. They've been doing a very good job on keeping the uh, public informed. However, we have to keep in mind that this is a very dynamic situation that's changing. And as information changes, as we gain new information and more experience about this new virus, those recommendations might change as well. So people have to keep in mind that the public health authorities are giving very good evidence-based information, but the evidence changes and the recommendations should, might change as well as time progresses and as the situation changes. Dr. Nimji, we just have a few seconds uh, left. Last word to you. Oh, thank you. I just say to everybody, again, follow that guidance that's out there. Use common sense guidance as well in terms of good hand hygiene and uh, make sure if you're sick, have any symptoms, stay at home to keep everybody else safe as well. I always like talking to emergency room doctors. You've seen it all. You're always so calm and explain things so well. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Viruses such as COVID-19 are incredibly difficult to treat once people become infected. But this week, a Vancouver company announced it's made significant progress. Greg Rasmussen looks at the potential for a coronavirus cure. When COVID-19 first emerged in China, things got very busy at this Vancouver biotech company. High-powered computers, artificial intelligence, and sophisticated lab work combined in a race to solve the world's biggest problem. And what happens at the next stage after this? At the next stage, they would be tested for ability to neutralize the virus itself. The theory is a treatment for COVID-19 already exists inside the human body. There's billions of different unique antibodies in any one given individual. And so what our platform is really good at is being able to sort through those billions of differences to find exactly the antibodies that we need in order to help develop that into a therapeutic. They say they're already making progress. It came after testing a blood sample from a patient who had recovered from COVID-19. Within days, the company identified more than 500 unique antibodies, the disease fighters inside those who've defeated the virus. Their immune system has done its job and it has cleared the virus. So in there they have the special sauce and that is where we want to look and find these therapeutics. Those 500 potentially helpful antibodies will now be used in a partnership with international drug giant Lilly. The goal, testing a new therapy in human patients within four months. You know, the atmosphere um, has become completely electric. So no one knew when a virus threat would emerge or what it would be, only that something, somewhere, would hit. For two years, we've had funding to prepare a technology for exactly this type of situation. And because of that, we're now ideally suited to respond quickly to this outbreak. The scientific battle against viruses has been full of false starts and painful setbacks. So these are my meds. This is what keeps me alive. Artist Tico Kerr was nearly killed by another virus, once considered untreatable. These are the two drugs that saved my life, Intellens and Persista. He keeps the empty pill bottles from HIV drugs, even using some in this self-portrait. The two of them together turn my viral load around in five days. This is about all of us. In 2005, he and other AIDS patients fought for access to experimental antiviral drugs. He was near death, with the infection running out of control.
I was putting my affairs in order. I didn't really have a lot of hope. He was saved at the last minute by a cocktail of new drugs. Now the virus is undetectable in his system. You can't kill a virus, but you can suppress it, and that's exactly what's happening in me. It's been on my mind a lot. I, I think we're, we're all really vulnerable right now. For those fighting this current battle, the days ahead are crucial, with so much at stake as they square off against a fierce, unforgiving opponent. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. When we come back, lessons from where the outbreak is hitting hardest. So if other countries aren't going to react in an extreme way right now, they're going to become it. The situation in Italy could happen anywhere, but Canadians can stop it from happening here. Plus, when COVID-19 spreads to Africa, how that continent is bracing for the worst. Today, Italian authorities reported the deadliest day yet from COVID-19. 368 lives lost in 24 hours. Una, due. Here's one right. grim measure of the toll on Italy. In this regional newspaper, the obituary section grew from two pages in February to 10 pages this week. More than 1,800 people have died. Italy stands out as the hardest hit Western country so far. Terence McKenna spoke to doctors there to see what Canada might have to brace for. Today, Cadonia, Italy, population 16,000, looks like a ghost town. The residents ordered to stay in their homes. Apparently, this is where the Italian coronavirus outbreak began on February 18th, when a 38-year-old athletic male with breathing problems was repeatedly turned away from his doctor's office and the local hospital without being tested he unknowingly spread COVID-19 to dozens of people over several days. Dr. Lorenzo Cassani is a hospital administrator in the area. We know that patient one went in and out at least three or four times from the emergency room, so uh, he spread the virus to other patients and also to uh, the healthcare workers. In Italy, the virus spread quickly from the smaller towns in the north to the big city of Milan. Then it exploded. Dr. Giacomo Grasselli leads a COVID-19 task force there. We were watching, you know, images, uh, movies or I mean, TV from China. We saw them building up to hospitals in a week. And I said, well, this is crazy. Now I, under perfect, I completely understand why they did that. It's like a bomb of patients that, that blows and, and, and you, you just, they just come out every day from some 60, 50, 60, 70 new patients. And you, really, it's a challenge of how to find a, a place for each one of them. So it's, it's incredible what's happening. I mean, it's, um, it's a very bad uh, experience, very bad experience. Now all the hospitals in northern Italy are stretched to the breaking point. The healthcare workers totally exhausted themselves terrified of contracting the virus and passing it on to their own families. <sighs> Ventilators are the only thing that will keep the sickest patients alive, and there may not be enough to go around. Doctors have to decide who lives and who dies. The elderly and those with complicating medical conditions might be sacrificed. So uh, if you have to choose between uh, a 75 years old person and a 20 years old person who you're gonna decide. Uh, obviously the person with the uh, higher expectation of life. There will be a moment that an anesthesiologist will have to take off the respirator from this 75 years old guy and give it to the 20 years old. Uh, and this will be a honorable choice. Now uh, effectively that means uh, that some people are being left to die uh, because it's not possible to treat everybody. Professor Yasha Monk of Johns Hopkins University has studied the ethical dilemmas of what used to be considered battlefield medicine. I can only imagine how psychologically devastating it must be for the doctors and nurses involved. They are already uh, at great danger to themselves, uh, working uh, around the clock in an extreme situation 
uh, seeing many people die. And now you add on top of that the psychological stress of having to look at a patient and say, I'm not going to be able to do anything for you. It's, it's hard to fathom. Yes, it becomes overwhelming for sure. But I have to say that doctors and nurses are doing, uh, like, I would say a heroic uh, job. They, they are saving uh, really thousands of lives and, and uh, working night and day to grant everyone the best uh, possible care. There is a debate about why Italy was the first major Western country to be hit, especially since it was among the first to ban flights from China. Some people point to the average age of the population, the oldest in Europe. Some point to the bad air pollution in northern industrial areas that has caused widespread lung disease. In the northern region, we have um, the most polluted air in the, uh, Europe, and this is linked with viral uh, infection, pneumonia infections. Also, uh, we do not have uh, emergency plans uh, for pandemics. We have it for uh, the natural disasters. And also we were the first, so we were totally unprepared. I think the question of why Italy is the most important question and it has a simple answer. No reason at all. The only thing that makes Italy different is that the first couple of cases arrived in Italy about 10 days before they arrived in Germany or the United States or Canada. So if other countries aren't going to react in an extreme way right now, they're going to become Italy. There have already been over 1,800 COVID-19 deaths in Italy. It has the highest mortality rate of any country, even that of China. Many suggest it is because there is still a vast number of actual infections that have not been diagnosed. Canadians are cautioned not to be reassured by the much lower number of deaths so far in Canada. My message to Canadians is that many countries around the world have thought something about them uh, makes them less susceptible to this virus than others, and that has proven wrong in every case. Um, Canadians are not miraculously exempt from dying from this disease, and they're not miraculously exempt from seeing it spread in an exponential fashion. The, the problem arises when this starts in a small community with a lot of people, when every people gets infected, it's like they, it's called super spread. It becomes more and more powerful, and then it explodes. So if you are able to identify the first cases and to contain them, then you might be safe or at least safer. But I would not wait until you have 10, 20, 30, 50 deaths. That's not the way to do it. Uh, the good news is that we know what can work. Canadians can look to South Korea, they can look to Singapore, they can look to China to understand what they have to do in order to avoid mass fatalities. And that is canceling everything now social distancing, staying at home, bosses telling their employees to work from home if it's at all possible, schools closing. That is what is needed now in order to save lives. This week, a team of Chinese infectious disease experts arrived in Rome to help fight the Italian outbreak. They brought almost two million surgical masks and hundreds of ventilators and defibrillators for intensive care units having been the origin of the worldwide pandemic. China is now in a position to help confront it. <coughs> As each day brings hundreds of new deaths in Italy, all Western countries study the Italian example of what could be in store for all of us in the weeks ahead. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. A growing list of African countries now reporting cases, the latest Rwanda. We reported today the first case of COVID-19. So just one confirmed infection, but Rwanda's government says it's already considering drastic measures. In South Africa, with dozens of cases, the virus has triggered a national disaster declaration. Susan Ormiston shows us how the COVID-19 pandemic is setting off alarm bells across that continent. Ethiopia screening passengers at the Bole airport coming from high-risk countries. Most coronavirus in Africa has been imported from outside the continent, but the relatively low numbers are climbing fast. Kenya's first case was a citizen traveling home. Returning from the United States of America via London. 
Kenya demonstrated its preparations as if to reassure, but now at least 23 countries have cases. At Africa's Center for Disease Control, the director told us it's just taking hold. We are very early in Africa in this pandemic. I characterize it that this is our morning. China is seeing the sunset. Europe and other countries, I mean, maybe in the middle of the day. Africans are extremely vulnerable. The rural population doesn't have adequate sanitation, health care is fragile, and in large, overcrowded cities, there's no way to impose social distancing. <laughs> Ethiopia revealed its first case Friday, a Japanese man who traveled here. But we also know that there's no country in the world that has reported a case and the case has not expanded to other cases. Some countries are now restricting travel in and out and some airlines have stopped travel from China, but Africa's biggest airline didn't. Ethiopian Airlines CEO told us Europe is the concern now, not China. Because we flew to China directly, we were not the first uh, country in Africa to have a confirmed case. It's Nigeria, it's Senegal, it's Morocco, it's Togo, countries which do not have any direct flight to China. Do you think you'll have to change your position on this? No. Africa, late to feel the threat of the virus, is now bracing for it. What projection can you make? My, unfortunately, my, my projections are, are, are not favorable, that we, will, we are in here for a very long haul and a very disruptive moment for the continent. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Addis Ababa. Still ahead, communities pulling together while staying apart. So I think it's, it's heartwarming to see how people are coming together and working together. How Canadians are helping the most vulnerable. And later, a message of solidarity from a country in lockdown. We'll be right back. For many of us, last week may have been the first time the pandemic felt close. And that's led to different reactions. Some people, as we've seen, rushing to buy up toilet paper. But tonight, Thomas Dagler shows us the pandemic is also bringing out a different side of Canadians. For all the people buying up supplies and hoarding, there are just as many helping. Like Bijan Arab and Mary Aitgar delivering groceries to those in self-isolation. We put them uh, behind their doors and we keep our distance. It's not just about helping people in the Iranian community. It's about anybody else, like anyone in Saskatoon who has traveled anywhere. Look online and you'll find Canadians pulling together. Offers of tutoring while kids are off school. Others running errands for seniors stuck inside. Plus a ton of other services offered on this Facebook group created by Kerry Holland. It's heartwarming to see how people are coming together and working together and trying to support each other the best way they can. A mother of two and a producer oh. in Toronto's normally booming oh, film industry, man. she's got plenty of colleagues suddenly out of work. So came the idea to let them advertise services and odd jobs. I think a combination of people needing to work and needing to support themselves and wanting to help. I feel like those are the two drivers. There's trouble for musicians, too, who've seen gigs cancelled across the board. Enter fiddler Ashley McIsaac, who, with a bit of ingenuity, is planning an online concert, connecting entertainers with fans staying at home. This is being able to look at somebody through the camera and say, we're with you. <laughs> no matter the place, that's the message. Instead of buying into the panic, we should really help each other out at this point. Consider it social unity, despite the social distancing. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, how a country in lockdown is saying thanks to those on the front lines. That is next in our moment. As the coronavirus continues to spread and more people get sick, healthcare workers are going flat out. So residents in Spain under lockdown scheduled a time to throw open their windows and celebrate their healthcare workers. And their moment of thanks is our moment. Oh, God, save 
That was such a terrific gesture. And of course, that applause could be made for uh, healthcare workers everywhere, including here in Canada. You think it's a, a tough, demanding job at the best of times. Add flu season and now COVID-19, and there must be lots of challenges, but not just healthcare workers, not to be mundane about it, but even people on the supply chain, delivery workers, uh, grocery store workers. I saw one earlier today, and he said uh, some of his colleagues calling in sick, a lot of them working overtime, so a lot of people stepping up in the midst of uh, these challenges. That is The National for March 15th. Good night.